World Beyond Belief. This is episode 132, and I am your co-host, Mindy Erkin. With me today, as always, is your host, Paul Marco. Hi, and welcome to the World Beyond Belief. This should be an exciting collection of topics today. What I plan to talk about is medicine, because I had a run-in with the medical establishment this week, had to go to the hospital, so I think it's important that we talk about that a little bit more. And another thing that's happening related to that, that I want to bring to your attention and make sure you're aware of what a strategy that the cabal is using now called the externalization of the hierarchy. We're in a time of the externalization of the hierarchy. This is the most recent tactic in their abil- in their plan to inflict a lot more draconian, restrictive, inhumane measures on the human population. And we'll discuss that a little bit in the second hour. I also want to get into talking a little bit about news sources. You know, Mindy and I often really criticize the activity of watching TV. I think it's the one thing that the Satanists have that really that are really holding us down. It's really keeping us in place. It's really doing an excellent job of mind controlling the masses. If it wasn't for TV, which is simply a mind control tool, I think that we'd be much better off and much freer and able to think and have our own opinions. I've often said on this show that I don't believe that if someone, I don't believe that someone who watches TV actually has their own opinions. I think that between the opinions that are given to them through the news, through what they call documentaries, which is, um, I don't know what you'd call long-term brainwashing, through what they call entertainment, which is full of symbolism and sigil magic, uh, communicating directly with your subconscious. I don't think that you could get up from watching TV for a few hours and say you have your own opinion. I'd say you have an opinion, but that opinion is basically given to you by the TV. The TV is a really effective tool at that. If you want to free your mind, you need to turn off the TV. Well, since then, I've heard from many people who say, well, Paul, you know, if I turn off the TV, how am I going to get information? I'm going to be behind. I'm not going to know what's going on. And exactly the opposite is true. If you turn off the TV, well, first of all, you'll free your mind and you'll get clear on a lot of things. And second of all, when you go back and you do use some of the sources that, I'm going to recommend them, but they're my sources. And if you don't like these sources, that's that's fine with me. But I want to help the people who want to get off of TV and stay current and really participate in the Grand Awakening the way they should be, some new sources. So later on in the broadcast, probably later in the second hour, we'll be going into things like where you can find your news, uh, mega sources that uh, will source you into a whole bunch of different news sources, and who you can trust, how you can trust, and this is from my standpoint now, um, to give you the accurate, truthful information that you need. Let's start by talking about the medical community. Well, as I said before, I was in the hospital this week, and it was only because I was in great pain. I wouldn't surrender myself to the allopathic medical system unless it was an extreme emergency. I was taught a long time ago to, um, if it's an ongoing problem, you have to use homeopathic or more natural medicines to treat those. Now, in emergencies, snake bite or the extreme pain that I had this week, it's really important that you go to an allopathic doctor. 
Uh, they first of all they have the drugs that can pull pull you out of the pain. <laughs> now, they didn't do that to me at first, um, but they do have those drugs. They have uh, a cadre of really slick diagnostic tools, so they can get you out of your pain, and they'll pretty much be able to tell you after you've been subjected to a little bit of radiation, quite a bit of radiation actually, uh, what the problem is. And then you can go and treat it however you want to because the medical community will treat it with pharmaceutical drugs or operations. That's the two things that they're uh, trained to do. Uh, I don't do pharmaceutical drugs. I do, actually, I did this week, I did antibiotics. But other than that, I kind of stay clear of them because, well, I have the internet, I know how to do research, and uh, I know a lot about the pharmaceutical community. Actually, I worked for Merck and Novartis in, during my past work life. But as I was laying in the hospital and I'm looking around the room, realizing what an incredibly unhealthy environment Actually, more than unhealthy, I would call it inhumane. This isn't an environment where I would expect someone to get healthy, feel like they want to hang on to life. It was a square room, um, painted kind of a kind of a pale yellow. Uh, there was a piece of artwork. Uh, I'm in South America, so the Artwork necessarily was a iconic, you know, it was definitely a Christian iconic thing, which was actually quite beautiful. I appreciated it being there. Everything else was set up for sanitation and efficiency. Um, and you don't mind that so much in many, many instances. But when you're trying to rally for your life, when you're trying to pull yourself back from illness, you kind of want to be in an environment where you want to get back to. You know, I don't know. I was in a room that had Wi-Fi, which is, if you've done any research, if you have the Internet, <laughs> if you have Wi-Fi, you can go on and Google the dangers of Wi-Fi. If you want to find more information, do DuckDuckGo Wi-Fi, and you'll find the dangers of Wi-Fi there. It's not a healthy environment to be in. It was, uh, it was very strange. Of course, then it has, there's a big TV on the side of the wall. Now, I didn't turn it on, so I didn't get that vibration. I couldn't stand that vibration. I cannot even, I can't, I can't take being in the vibration of TV. Right. And what about the fluorescent lighting? That's disturbing in itself. And the fact that they leave it on all night long so that you're you don't even get a good night's rest because you're under fluorescent lights. Right. And then, of course, there's the people that come in. Now, I know, personally, many nurses that are fantastically wonderful people. Many of them have gotten into that profession because of service to others, because they want to help others. But for some reason, in this hospital, it was all about efficiency. They'd rush from one thing to another, um, not stopping to say hello or, or visit with you. They, they, did, they seemed to do their best to make you feel like uh, you're a car in there for an oil change or you're going to get your transmission redone. You're a human being, and there's been many studies done that if you know what's going on with you and you're cared for well in the company of people who care about your well-being, you're going to get healthy much faster. But we're probably working, I don't know this for sure, but we're probably working with a model. Uh, the people who own the hospital or run the hospital are working with a financial model because the whole world is run on a financial model. So the less treatment you can give me, the faster, the less nurses you can have on the faster you can run them from one patient to another, the more money you're going to make, the more efficient it's going to be. Honestly, I've never felt more like a piece of meat 
than I am when I go to the hospital. I feel like this would be a great treatment for a car. Yeah, get the mechanic in there, have the the book that they need set up, have the part right there, have them go in, you know, you know, in mechanics, they time the, uh, the amount of time that the mechanic spends on, on your car based on whatever needs to be done. You can't spend two hours changing the oil. You have to do it in a reasonable amount of time because there's a financial model. Well, that's, I felt like I was a cog in a financial model. Just being there, they would come in every hour or so and take my blood pressure. Now, I, I don't know why that's such an important thing, but apparently it is. And many times they didn't smile, didn't look at me, grab my arm, and here we go. We're taking my blood pressure. <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing dehumanizing uh, place to be when you're in there to try to get your health back. And then there's the meals. Now, I've been real particular with my diet for, oh, 20, 25 years because I've had health issues with it. And we went from one thing to another and we tried to keep up with what's, what's, an important, what's important in your diet, why, why you have to eat certain things and why you don't eat certain things. Well, for every meal, we got, uh, I got a lump of white rice, which, you know, that's just a pile of starch. There's no vitamins, minerals, or anything uh, substantial in white rice. So that's the one thing. And of course, you get a little pile of vegetables. And the vegetables are so cooked that the actual color, the natural color of the vegetable is gone. And also you have a piece of meat. Now, I was only able to eat in the hospital because of, because of other problems. Uh, but I can imagine what it would be like if someone would eat like this. Also, they had these little desserts. And it was like, what's the dessert that Bill Cosby used to advertise? Jello. Yeah, is it jello or some type of pudding? I mean, and you get it in your mouth and it kind of, the sugar kind of grinds in your teeth. Um, and you got a little glass of juice. Well, down here the juice is absolutely inexpensive to have really good juice. So we have, we have good juice. But I can't imagine if someone were to be subjected to that diet for any length of time, how they could even survive, let alone recover. Didn't Dan's... Didn't Dan have a story about his mother? Well, that was the impetus behind him getting involved in discovering MMS and using it because his mother I, seemed to recall that she died in the hospital from malnutrition. And it's easy to see how that can happen because there is absolutely no nutrition in the hospital meals. And they serve you a cup of coffee with refined white sugar. Right. I hadn't. I had taken myself off a of coffee two years ago because it just burnt, ate holes right through my stomach. It's unbelievable what they serve as food in a hospital to patients who need good nutrition more than anything. Right. Now, there may be hospitals that have a, have a good staff, that have a good cafeteria staff, that make really wholesome meals. I've never run into one. Not once. But there might be those those things out there, and if you if you live near one of those, then you're really lucky. But I don't think it fits into the financial model. That's exactly right. I don't think they certainly they can afford it, and certainly it could cut into their profits. But you know that every corporation that's publicly traded has to make all of its decisions based on the best interest of its. Stockholders. Stockholders, not its patients, not its um, doctors, the best interests of its patients, not of its nurses, of its, of its stockholders. stockholders. It's, it's all, all about we, the bottom line, the profits. Right. So anyway, so I had to talk a little bit about the medical 
system today. Uh, but to understand what's going on with the medical system and actually all the other systems in this strange time on the planet, you really need to understand the notion of the inversion. Now, we've talked about something like that on this podcast before. We call it uh, the archontic distortion. In that, what happens is, the archons are in charge of our world right now. And I hope it won't be for much longer, but it, it's the case right now. And what they do is they take anything that's natural and normal, and they twist it and pervert it into something that's unhealthy and unnatural. Uh, for example, uh, a tree, a tree of life that offers fruit. I mean, money doesn't grow on trees, but all good stuff grows on trees. Avocados, mangroves, uh, all kind of citrus. A tree is a wonderful thing. Actually, it's the symbol of our, our planet, uh, Sophia. And what they've done is they've twisted it and perverted it. They've made it the symbol of their god, Yahweh, in the form of a yarmulke, right? Menorah. A menorah, I'm sorry. Uh, I always use also uh, the example of an apple. An apple is a, a health food. You'll find it on many health diets. But the archons... They change the apple into a candy bar. It's sweeter, it's more appealing, but it comes with a wrapper that's non-disposable. It rots your teeth. And I've never seen a, a Mars bar on a health food diet. So what they do is take something, a sweet treat, like an apple, and they, and they twist it and pervert it. Uh, David Icke calls it an, adver an inversion. Let's hear David Icke talk about the inversion for a minute and give a couple examples. Hello and welcome to this video cast for subscribers to davidike.com. Now I've been uh, writing in the books for a long time now about what I call the inversion. How the world and human society is inverted. Not just a little bit inverted here and there but inverted almost wherever you look. Not just in the sense of inverted from what it should be and what the world would be uh, nicer for if it was um, the other way around, but inverted in the sense that almost everything you look at in human society is on its head. And I uh, had a couple of um, stories on the website this week, which, if you put them together and put it together with lots of other stuff I'm going to talk about, then the fact that the world is not only inverted, but systematically inverted through cold calculation for reasons of human control, becomes perfectly bloody obvious. One of them was about sunglasses. Sunglasses? What's that got to do with it? Well, actually quite a lot, um, because it is a gateway into a lot of inversion. It was being pointed out um, in one of the stories that wearing sunglasses in anything like, um, you know, regular uh, use is not good for health. Why? Because we are receiving information, energy, from the sun all the time. And one way that we use that information, and it's vital to not just what we call physical function, what I would call holographic function, but actually mental and emotional function as well. And it's the way that um, the pineal gland in the uh, brain... Uh, receives this information from the sun in the form of what we call light 
and then transforms it into different electrochemical forms, which is then communicated through the body and is uh, fundamental, you cannot uh, stress enough, fundamental to human health. So, people who wear sunglasses all the time, uh, when, when it, ever the sun comes out, uh, are denying the pineal gland that source of information because the pineal gland thinks, well, uh, it's night time, <laughs> there's no light. And so it acts and functions as if that's the case. And this takes me through to something else about inversion. And that is the way we are told, in effect now, to fear the sun and to fear cholesterol. And these are two classic inversions, as I will explain. Um, first of all, we need the sun for enough vitamin D. And without vitamin D, we get a big uh, list of uh, health effects. Not just health effects, but mental effects. Let me just give you an idea of what happens if we are um, deficient in vitamin D. This comes from the Vitamin D Council, um, headed by a man called Dr. Jacob Cannell, MD. And he's listing here the consequences of insufficient vitamin D. Autoimmune diseases, cancer, chronic pain, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, uh, mental illness, including um, things like Alzheimer's, are um, affected by lack of vitamin D. Multiple sclerosis, muscle weakness and coordination, obesity, osteoarthritis. Vitamin D is also uh, vital to brain function. It's vital to bone health. And um, according to uh, various uh, mainstream medical surveys, um, having low vitamin D gives you a 35% uh, higher chance of heart disease, a 14% uh, greater chance of cancer, and two-thirds of the population, it is said, are not getting enough vitamin D. Just to give you um, an idea about multiple sclerosis, the highest figures in America are in the north, where there's less sun, and the lowest figures are in the south, where, of course, there's, there's lots of sun. Why? Vitamin D. Now, this brings me to cholesterol inversion. What we're told now is, like the sun, that cholesterol is bad for us. Got to lower your cholesterol. Ooh, if you don't. And now, what they're doing is they're selling this extraordinary garbage, this extraordinary scam called statins to lower cholesterol. Lower cholesterol, good for health. Well, it absolutely is not. Why? Because cholesterol just happens to be absolutely crucial in converting sunlight into vitamin D. So when you have very low cholesterol or cholesterol lower than it should be, from the body's point of view, not Stone Age medicine, then you're not converting sunlight into vitamin D, and that's a whole world, just listed it, of potential health and mental health effects of that. So, it's all kind of an inversion. Everything's an inversion. So, sun's, oh, bad for you. No, it's not. Cholesterol, bad for you. No, it's not. Not in the way they say, anyway. And it's essential cholesterol, never mind bad for you. And then they say, oh, oh, but, but the sun gives you sun cancer. Well, you know, you know one of the effects of sunlight through sunglasses, etc., not reaching the pineal gland in the quantity necessary, is it stops the production of substances in the skin 
which protects you from the sun. And there's another thing. Oh, no, you, the sun's dangerous. Uh, you've got to put sunblock all over you. What does sunblock contain? Chemicals. And do you think that the explosion in the use of sunblock and sun chemicals in, uh, in terms of protecting the, the body, the skin from the sun, as they said, do you think the skin coming into contact with that deluge often during the summer of chemical cocktail will be good for its health? And what we're going to find, and it's, it's, it's inevitable as well, the sun coming up, is that a great deal of skin cancer is actually being caused by A, the chemicals in the sunblock, inversion, and the fact that the lack of information being decoded from the sun by the pineal gland is lowering the sun's, uh, or, or sorry, the skin's natural defenses to the negative side of too much sun. And so, wherever you look, you see inversion. Uh, my great friend, um, Mike Lambert, at the Shen Clinic, just down the road from here on the Isle of Wight, um, who is a genius healer uh, of decades of experience. He's been telling me for years and years and years and years and years, fat is not bad for you, it is absolutely necessary. At the same time, we've had the fear the sun version of fat, haven't we? Oh, you mustn't eat fat, it's bad for you, it'll give you all trouble and all that. And as Mike has been pointing out all these years, fat doesn't make you fat. Carbohydrates make you fat. Carbohydrates start to um, change uh, blood sugar levels, so there's this explosion of diabetes. Why? Because carbohydrates turn to a sugar called glucose in the body. And then the body has to deal with that tidal wave of sugar. Oh, I'm just having a bit of bread, mate, and a bit of pasta. It's not, it's not sugar. Yes, it is when it gets in the body, darling. And so now, after all these years of Mike telling me this, now mainstream doctors and studies are coming out and saying, oh, it, we, we told you fat was bad for you, but, but actually it's not. Well, that was my favorite guy, David Icke. You can rely on him for information. He knows what's going on. And I trust him completely. I, I mean, I would say it's almost cult to personality with me and David. Although it's not. I have disagreed with him on things. Uh, you can trust him. When we get into our second, in the second hour, we're going to talk about news sources. He keeps his uh, website up to date with certain news stories that are critical for you to know. So, uh, not to get ahead of myself, but that's David Icke. The cholesterol deal, um, we went through that ourselves. I had a heart attack about 10 years ago. And uh, actually the heart attack turned out to be much worse than it needed to be because the hospital couldn't mobilize a doctor for me right away. So uh, the heart attack continued and continued. But anyway, when you leave the hospital after having a heart attack, you're full of different types of drugs and statins and Coumadin and all these other type of cholesterol-lowering drugs. Well, I was, you know, I'm the type of person that reads a lot. So I was given a lot of books and got a lot of books on heart attacks. And a lot of them centered around um, stress being the major cause. And that certainly was the case for my heart attack. But, you know, they... There's also books about, you know, lifestyle and things. And one of the things that came up over and over in these books 
was this thing called the Dean Ornish Diet. And this Dean Ornish Diet supposedly was the only diet that could reverse heart disease. No, heart disease, that's another strange thing. So I went out and bought the book on Dean Ornish Diet, and Mindy and I started giving me the Dean Ornish Diet, which was, I believe it was 10 grams of fat a day, 3 grams of saturated fat. And if you think it's easy to do a diet like that, you're crazy. What did we had to go through? All kind of strange new you couldn't use fat in cooking. What were some of the things that you did for that? Well I do recall that we had just been to the grocery store and we had to get rid of a lot of food because everything was way too high in fat. Uh well we eliminated Mm, oils and you had to um, cook in broth rather than any any oil any olive oil or butter all these things that actually turn out to be quite good for you what about applesauce you used applesauce oh yes I substituted applesauce in recipes and well we substituted all kinds of things we switched over to stevia and eliminated all sugar right it's been a long time. I can't really recall all the details, but it was quite an endeavor to get you onto that low fat. Right. Diet. I couldn't. And when I would go out to do my programs, I was a consultant at the time. I had to take a can of beans, I remember, because everything else had fat in it. Of course, I couldn't eat in any cafeteria or anything because. Right, One and that's bite. hard enough. We were vegetarians at the time, which made it easy to switch to that diet. That was a vegetarian diet. But it's hard enough when you're on the road to eat a good diet if you're a vegetarian to begin with, let alone a next-to-no-fat diet. Right. So as the, as the time passed, studies started showing things that were not on my diet were actually good for your heart, like avocados. And one thing after another got put back onto the diet because there were studies showing that they were actually good for your, for your health. So finally we found out that the low cholesterol thing was a scam. Uh, one of the bigger, big sources was Fat Sally Phelan's book, Nourishing Traditions. Right. That's that was a book based on the work of Dr. Weston Price, who was a dentist but studied people from around the world to see, you know, what the consistencies were in the people who had the best health, which he was able to determine by their dental remains, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And as it turns out, animal fats are crucial to good health. Right. And one um, factoid supports that argument is that in 1921, they had the first heart attack in the United States. And Sally Fallon went back and found out what they ate before 1921. And fun to find out, it's a high-fat diet. And then not too long ago, I came across a statistic. Now, this is not a study, because all the studies regarding cholesterol and health are going to be done by the drug companies. And even if they're done by uh, an agency like the FDA, the FDA has no laboratories able, able to do competent studies. So they have to be done out in the, out in the field. So we found out that between 2000 and 2009, 75% of all the heart attacks took place in people that measured with low cholesterol. Since then, I'm sure there's been a million studies done by the manufacturers of statins and, and other drugs that show that cholesterol is really bad for you. But, you know, once you get a product and a profit center around cholesterol, you're not going to let that go. Well, you can't let it go because you're obligated to your stockholders to do what's in their best interest. So to do studies that that show your product is effective and show, show that your product does something that's in the best interest of your stockholders. I, satanic as hell, isn't it? I know it's satanic as hell, and people wouldn't do that, but they do do that. They're financially driven, and that's what it's all about. So anyway, I was glad that, that 
David, I mentioned the cholesterol scan. Uh, we've been off of that, and uh, I'm actually on the paleo diet now. And I've been healthier than I've ever been, more active, except for this severe pain I had this week. Uh, doing really well. I also want to throw in here while I'm on medicine, I want to talk about the vaccine agenda. Now, if you can think of a of an endeavor as basically evil as the medical medicine endeavor, and I, and I don't even call it healthcare anymore because that's an oxymoron. It has nothing to do with health. It has nothing to do with care. It has everything to do with getting you ill because they don't make a profit if you're healthy and eventually getting you dead, which is where, you know, the satanic agenda wants to get you. Now, I've heard over and over again this week about the vaccine agenda, the measles vaccine uh, with, with Disney and and who was giving free vaccines that we heard about. Oh, if you get a Happy Meal, you get a free vaccine, measles vaccine. Listen, these Satanist bastards, they love to kill. And their favorite method of killing is poison. And so if they give you a vaccine, it may not poison you this week or next week or next year, but you're going to have ill effects. Actually, what's happening is I noticed that this morning I was reading that the media and the mump was at the mumps vaccine. Two of the people vaccinated with the mumps vaccine immediately got the mumps. The vaccine agenda is a satanic agenda. You want to stay away from that. If, if you want to take my advice, do your own research. I, you know, I don't care. But from what I've come up with, it's a satanic agenda, and it wants your ill health. Why else? Think about this. I really want you to think about this. Why else would they mandate a vaccine? Why else would they mandate a vaccine? Look, if there's five people and there's an Ebola outbreak out, coming out and they've got an effective Ebola vaccine, why would they mandate it? Four of the people get the vaccine, they don't get Ebola, right? The last one doesn't get the vaccine, he gets Ebola and dies. Who cares? It's his choice. If the vaccine actually works, it shouldn't matter to the people who've taken the vaccine. But the vaccines do not work. In fact, they give you the disease. And I think for people who don't know, I know this is totally off topic, but really it isn't. It isn't. The bottom line is Agenda 21. The controllers of everything want to reduce the population. So the medical system plays right into reducing the population because it doesn't make people healthy. It kills people. Right. It's a sacred cow. They won't allow really valid things to come out. I mean, if you, if you look at, what well, was it last year's flu vaccine? They admitted it didn't even work. Now, what the side effects are, you know, you can only speculate. Uh, also, you have the MMR. Vaccines that give kids autism. They're still giving them. The CDC recommends it. Obama just came out last week and said that the people that published the study that showed that there was no, it was a falsified study actually, it, om it omitted critical information that showed that the MMR vaccine was related to autism. They, 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 uh, he said that those people are not liable. The people that did that study are not liable for that. But they still recommend it. There should be massive lawsuits. Every person who's had that, had that vaccine and has an autistic child should be bound together on a lawsuit. I'm sure, maybe they are. I just can't get the information on it. But they certainly should be. And if you can't get it through law, you really have to do something as a human being to stand up to this kind of tyranny. All right, while I was sitting, uh, thinking about this podcast and figuring, figuring out what I was going to talk to you guys about, 
I came up with this model, and this model is a little abrasive, um, but to me it straightens out in my mind just how incredibly evil this practice is. There are people in this world who don't have the internet. Uh, there are many people in this world that don't have electric. Honestly, I work for uh, a corporation that was trying to get universal telephone use back in 1999. And he realized that only half the people in the world had access to telephones at that time. So there's vast numbers of population that doesn't have, doesn't have electric and certainly doesn't have internet. And if they have internet, it's firewalled off and they can't get the correct information. Those people, I just think they just don't know. That's a big category of people who are innocents. They are pure innocents and they don't know. And it's up to people like you and I, people who are listening to this, to set things straight so they're not victimized. They're just innocents. And then there's people who have access to the Internet, and they're educated, and they know. And they choose not to know. I call them willfully ignorant. And there's no excuse, but it's kind of a harmless thing. They may not be pulling us down with them. They might just be doing things like uh, deciding uh, that they can vaccinate their children uh, because they haven't really read anything conclusive about vaccines. Well, the reason they haven't let it, read anything conclusive is because they're willfully ignorant of it. They haven't looked at it. There's no excuse for willful ignorance. If you've got the Internet and you've got a two brain cells to rub together. You need to know what's going on in your world. I mean, we told you many, many weeks ago about a woman we know who had a friend, and he had inherited a large tract of land somewhere in the Midwest. And he was allowing them to frack this land. And to assuage, he knew that the fracking wasn't good. So he, was, uh, he wasn't willfully ignorant. He was in the next category I'm going to talk about in a minute. But he allowed them to do it. But to assuage his guilt, he gave massive amounts of money to the Nature Conservatory. Now, if you have an Internet and you take, the, take a few minutes, you'll find that the Nature Conservatory is not on your side. It's working toward Agenda 21. It's a horrible organization that takes people's money and implements this inhumane agenda to, to corral people onto these small, um, like prison colonies, um, to go forward. That's your nature, nat natural conservatory. So he was, I don't call it willfully ignorant when you know what's going on and then you still do it. I call that stupidity. And, but he was trying to assuage his gu guilt by doing something where he was willfully ignorant. So... You really have to know what's going on. This isn't a time you can sit on your hands, go home and watch, watch TV and expect to know what's going on. You're going to get hurt by this. Your family's going to get hurt by this. They're being hurt by it already with the, as, far as, as far as they got on this, on this vaccine agenda. And if you go a little further, you have people who are willfully ignorant. You take someone like a doctor who it's his responsibility to know about statins. It's his or her responsibility to know about all of these things. It's responsibility to know about these things. There are saintly doctors out there like Len Horowitz, Gary Null, who know about these things and are, and are standing up and not allowing people to be harmed by these things. If you're a doctor, listen to me. If you're a doctor and you willfully know, and you should know because it's your field, it's your business to know, and you still prescribe these drugs that damage and harm people, that's not willful or ignorant. That's not playing around. That's satanic. You're playing into the satanic agenda. And unless you stop it, and stop it right now, you're bringing it, you're, you're we're all in the handbasket, and where the hell are we going? 
So that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that you've gone way beyond willfully ignorant. And you've gone into the, the satanic camp. You cannot practice medicine without knowing how to heal people, without being in the healing business. So, so here's your medical practice. David Icke has written a book called The Perception Deception that I recommend everybody read because you really can't get in touch with what the agenda is or know what real news is or know what's really going on without knowing this agenda. Here's what he has to say about the medical community. Well, he starts out by saying that it's the number one killer in the United States, the treatments. Add together all the doctor errors, drug reaction fatalities, deadly infections picked up in hospitals, etc., and you find that doctors and treatment by mainstream sources are the leading cause of death ahead of heart disease and cancer. An investigation by the respected online consumer report said, infection, surgical mistakes, and other medical harm contributes to the deaths of 180,000 hospital patients a year, according to projections based on a 2010 report from the Department of Health and Human Services. Another 1.4 million are seriously hurt by their hospital care. And those figures apply only to Medicare patients. What happens to other people is less clear because most hospital errors go unreported and hospitals report on only a fraction of things that can go wrong. There is an epidemic of healthcare harm, says Rosemary Gibson, a patient safety advocate and author. More than 2.25 million Americans will probably die from medical harm in this decade, she says. That's like wiping out the entire populations of North Dakota, Rhode Island, and Vermont. It's a man-made disaster. Hospitals haven't given safety the attention it deserves, says Peter Pronovost, MD, Senior Vice President for Patient Safety and Quality, at Johns Hopkins Medicine in Baltimore. Nor has the government, he says. Medical harm is probably one of the three leading causes of death in the U.S., but the government doesn't adequately track it, as does deaths from automobiles, plane crashes, and cancer. It's appalling. So it's no secret now, doctors. It's no secret now what's going on. It's no secret the results of your practice is, is becoming well known. Now, now I also want to say, as a little disqualifier, that many doctors are really good at diagnosing, uh, even though they have to use, of course, radiating uh, instruments to diagnose. They're really good at diagnosing, and they can really pinpoint problems. But then they turn around and they don't use the best, the best practices in terms of what actually heals people. They've just about done away with homeopathy. They've done, done away with naturopathy. They've done away with a lot of these things that actually cure people and make them able to go, to go on. Yeah, this week I was in the hospital and they had up-to-date equipment and the doctor that I had was an excellent diagnostician. He certainly could use the internet and he certainly could research things. But he felt free in giving me uh, prescribing a statin, even though we had talked about the cholesterol thing. And I'd let him in on some of the things that I knew about that. It's very difficult when you get an advanced degree to let go of the paradigms that make up that advanced degree. You know, we. <laughs> We were exposed to an interesting medical model when we were traveling in Brazil one year, uh, and actually it was 2010. And it was a very different type of model, and I wonder what results this model would have compared to the results that the American medical model have. Now, let, let me tell you the situation once. We were in a small village, and when I was in this village, there was what well, was like a, a flu that was going around that caused you to lose bowel control and 
vomit. I mean, it was an intestinal virus. And we were staying with friends, which was <laughs> put, put, put me in a really difficult situation, uh, messy situation, you could say. Actually, I'll tell you when this exact happened. This happened during the Fukushima disaster. So we went to the doctor that was only there in the evening, and we went to a little shabby little hospital. I'm not sure what kind of equipment it had. I, I would imagine not much. I would imagine an MMR wasn't there. I would imagine they had enough stuff to stitch you up and could probably get you to a bigger city hospital and an ambulance. But I waited for probably mm, a half hour in the waiting room, took my time, and then we went in to see the doctor. It was, it was kind of a Spartan office, very rustic. And there was a short man sitting behind the desk. This is what I remember. If you remember something different, tell me. Man. Um, and uh, he smiled at me, and uh, he actually knew what my problem was when I went in there. So I didn't even need to explain it to him. He says, you have a virus that's going around. He said, and uh, he says, I can do three things. He says, I can prescribe you a, a medication, which he meant a pharmaceutical. And he said, you'll, it'll be done, you'll be done with it in three to five days. He said, or you can drink Agua de Coke. Now, Agua de Coke is uh, all doctors in Brazil, in the outback in Brazil where we were. I don't know about Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. But Aqua G Coke is what they prescribe, and it, well, it's just coconut water. You get a fresh coconut, you make a hole in it, and you drink the water out of it. And it's good for everything. It's like natural Gatorade without, it has electrolytes. It's like natural Gatorade without any of the harmful side effects. It's a great thing. He says, you can drink that, and it'll clear, your condition will clear up in three to five days. He says, or you can do nothing. In which case, your condition will clear up in three to five days. So he laid, laid it on the line. I said, okay, doctor, thank you very much. And then he came out from behind the desk, and he had one incredibly short leg. He had, a, he had blocks under one of his shoes. So he came clogging out from behind the desk, big smile on his face, gave me a big hug, and he says, relax. Pay your bills. Be happy. And I left, I left the office. Now, some of you can say, well, that's not a medical model. That's not going to cure anything. But I'll bet you his medical model has a lot better luck, has a lot better results than the medical model that kills more people than anything in the United States. What do you think? I think that's absolutely true, and I think that one factor behind that is that the human body can heal itself under the right circumstances, and bombarding it with tons of chemical pharmaceuticals is not the right circumstances that enables the body to heal itself exactly. under duress. Exactly. They take, it's an interesting culture, but it's a culture of health and vitality and, and love. And that kind of thing really helps you repair yourself or, or even leave the earth. If this, if this is the time for you to go, there's an organization in um, type of Salvador. The Bon Morts? The Bon Morts. And it's a group of women who come and live with dying people. And they, they cook for the dying person and they hold his hand or her hand, and they sing with them, and they just make them rejoice in the life that they've been living. And although they're not designed to cure anything, I certainly would like to depart my time on this earth, which we all have to do, in that kind of care, rather than sitting in an antiseptic room with Wi-Fi and the TV and piles of white rice being fed to me. I mean, it's, it's a mess. It's an inversion. The medical system is an inversion. 
And when you deal with the medical system, whether it's taking your child to a pediatrician, taking advice from the CDC, considering vaccine, realize that that is, is a primary inversion. Hey, there's another inversion we're going to talk about in the second hour, the pharmaceutical industry inversion. I mean, this is like kind of like the most satanic of the satanic part of the, the medical community. This is straight out killing for profit. But let's listen to some music. Let's listen to The Savages and a song called You Are My Chocolates. Well, welcome back to part two on The World Beyond Belief, episode 132. <laughs> we were talking about the medical... Um, the medical, uh, what could you call it? The medical mm. system. Inversion. The inverted medical system that's really there for your, to make you ill and eventually dead. Um, big part of that, and maybe one of the big motivating components of that part, is the pharmaceutical industry. And we, I was going to gather some information on the, this industry. I mean, of course, you know that... Um, It's been related to multiple uh, problems. Uh, I mean, if you go back to the Spanish flu outbreak in 1893, uh, the only people that really died in major percentages from that were the people that took aspirin because they were pushing aspirin because they were starting up this thing called the pharmaceutical, what could you call it, pharmaceutical investment trust or something like that, where all these pharmaceutical companies organized by the Rockefellers were, you know, profiting by this virgining industry, this virgining pharmaceutical industry. And it hasn't cleaned up its act since then. It's still, bottom line, return to the stockholders, um, but I, I came across a, an incredible HBO special event on pharmaceuticals, and it's hilarious. It, it does exactly what I want it to do. It entertains and also informs. It's a really cool little, um, uh, what can I call it, a vignette. I'm going to play it for you. You're, I think that you'll really enjoy this. It's really hilarious, and it tells a lot about how the pharmaceutical industry relates to your doctor. Prescription drugs, the only ovals that can bring people in the Seattle area joy anymore. <laughs> to, to put it mildly, to put it mildly, America takes a lot of these things. 70% of Americans take at least one prescription drug. More than half of us take two. Researchers say a record four billion prescriptions were written in 2011. Total drug spending jumped last year by 3% to nearly $330 billion with a B. Wow. That works out to $1,000 per person on prescription drugs. Kind of makes you feel like Walter White could have made more money cooking up rheumatoid arthritis medication. <laughs> But, but should this really be that surprising? Because it's impossible to escape pharmaceutical ads. You, you can't turn on the TV without being subjected to an endless stream of sleep-inducing moths, old men getting boners while varnishing chairs, or this. If your bladder is calling the shots, you may have a medical condition called overactive bladder, or OAB. Again? But we just went. OK, OK, listen. What that woman really needs is a pill to stop her hallucinating anthropomorphic bladders. <laughs> you're, you're locked inside a prison of your own mind, Susan. Be gone, demon bladder, be gone! <laughs> but, but, but that's only one small part of pharmaceutical marketing. You see, drugs aren't like most other products, because you need someone's permission to buy them, which is why all drug ads end with the same catchy phrase. Ask your doctor if Lunesta is right for you. Ask your doctor about Mirbetric. Ask your doctor. Ask your doctor. Ask your doctor. Ask your doctor. Three words you're either hearing in a commercial or saying to your co-worker when he asks you if the mole on his back looks cancerous. <laughs> I don't know, Gene. Ask your doctor. All I said was, how was your weekend? 
It's probably fine. Drug companies know that doctors hold all the real power in the prescription drug business, which is why, while they spend nearly $4 billion a year marketing directly to us, they spend an estimated $24 billion a year marketing directly to doctors. In fact, one analysis claimed that in 2013, nine out of the top ten drug makers spent more on marketing than they did on research. Drug companies are a bit like high school boyfriends. They're much more concerned with getting inside you than being effective once they're in there. <laughs> so, we thought... We thought... OK. Don't, don't think about that too much. We thought... Don't, we, we, thought we thought we would take a look. We thought we'd take a look at how all that marketing money gets spent, which turns out to be surprisingly difficult. It's a pretty secretive world. You, you usually only get tantalising glimpses into during lawsuits years after the fact. For instance, in 2012, the government settled a case with the makers of asthma medication Advair over allegedly irresponsible marketing practices, which meant for the first time we were able to see this video of a 2001 Advair sales meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Daryl Baker, Simon Jones, Rob Yacht, and Ken Tyma. Y'all ready for this? What the f***? <laughs> that was for an asthma medication, and they were treating it like an NBA pregame show. Please welcome, he's 59, white, he likes turkey sandwiches, and his wife's name is Karen. Ladies and gentlemen, say hello to Daryl Boom Boom Baker! <laughs> the, the audience in that room were pharmaceutical reps, the foot soldiers in every company's drug marketing efforts. Now, drug companies will tell you their reps are there to educate doctors, but behind closed doors, that message can be a little different. There are people in this room who are going to make an ungodly sum of money selling ad there. And you know who you are. Ungodly. <laughs> that would barely be an appropriate tone if they were trying to get cereal into people's bodies, let alone drugs. <laughs> now, now you, don't, you don't need to see the people whooping in that room to know what they look like, because pharmaceutical sales reps are famously young, attractive people. In fact, this is so widely known, it's become a sitcom punchline for years. Today's the day the pharmaceutical reps show up to peddle their new drugs. And at Sacred Heart, that means one thing. Julie's here. The doctor, give me the news. I got a vacation loving you. If something is a joke on Scrubs, you know it's common knowledge. <laughs> That show did not do a lot of arcane, hey, what is it with phlebotomists and French cuisine? Am I right? <laughs> you are right, Turk. We're great friends. <laughs> the, the, the problem comes... The problem comes if those reps don't understand the effects of the drugs they're pushing. Listen to one former rep describe his first training session. I was in a room with 21 classmates and two trainers, and I was the only one with a science background. In fact, on the first day of training, I taught my class and my instructors the very basic process by which two brain cells communicate. So, essentially, pharma reps are like the cast of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> they're young, they're hot, and they have virtually no medical training whatsoever. <laughs> now, now, to be fair, most doctors will probably take that into consideration. The problem comes when some don't. I even had one physician um, who would often bring out a patient chart. If she was having a difficult patient or whatever the case is, she'd bring out a patient chart and be like, OK, Kathleen, I've tried this, I've tried this. What do you recommend here in terms of tweaking? And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm a political science major. You're asking me, you know, what to prescribe for this patient. Yeah, exactly. Because the only question a poli-sci major is really qualified to answer is, was it weird having to move back in with your parents after college? <laughs> If you're thinking, if, if you're thinking at this point, if you're thinking, why do doctors let drug reps into their offices at all? Well, they don't come empty-handed. They'll often show up with free samples and, even better, free chicken palm. Whoever said there's no such thing as a free lunch hasn't worked in a doctor's office. There are some offices that advertise in the front desk job description free lunch every day. Not because the doctors are paying for it, because the drug reps are bringing it in every day. Free lunch every day. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, but think about it. Lunch is awesome. <laughs> if, if Charlie Manson brought me a free lunch every day, I'd at least listen to his sales pitch on forehead swastikas. <laughs> I don't think it's for me, Charlie, but keep talking. That's delicious. 
Drug companies don't do this to be friendly. They do it because they know it works. In fact, they know a terrifying amount about nearly every prescription coming out of a doctor's office. Every time a, a patient goes into a pharmacy to get a prescription filled. The information is sold to drug companies who send it to laptops out in the field. So we see everything that the doctor does, how many prescriptions he prescribes of our medication and the competitor's medication. If the computer shows a doctor's not prescribing as promised. All you have to do is say, hey, you're banging out a lot of prescriptions for the competitor's drug and not mine. What's going on? Yeah, what's going on, Carl? You seem to be making medical decisions based on your best judgment. I brought you a meatball sub with chips, Carl. Don't f*** me on this! Don't f*** me, Carl! With this, with this level of pressure, unsurprisingly, drug companies have in the past crossed the line, pushing doctors to prescribe pills for non-FDA-approved uses. That's called going off-label. And here is a horrifying example involving AstraZeneca, who the government charged with going off-label with Seroquel an antipsychotic with dangerous side effects. The allegations, which were very troubling, were that they were taking a drug that was really approved for fairly narrow uses, bipolar disorders and schizophrenia, and uh, marketing it for everything from sleeplessness to depression and dementia. Here's the thing. You can't just give people potentially dangerous drugs and see what happens. You're a Fortune 500 company, not a white guy with dreadlocks at Burning Man. <laughs> now, AstraZeneca denied any wrongdoing, but it paid half a billion dollars to settle the lawsuits. And if you're thinking, well, look, that's just one company with one drug, you should know that just about every major drug company has paid money to settle similar charges. Johnson & Johnson paid $2.2 billion. Eli Lilly paid $1.4 billion. Pfizer and its subsidiary paid $2.3 billion. And GlaxoSmithKline paid out a record $3 billion to settle accusations that it had, among other things, pushed Wellbutrin, an antidepressant, as a cure for weight gain and sexual dysfunction. Or, as one former drug rep describes the pitch... It was a quick zinger for your uh, doc to tell your doctor, hey, doc, remember Wellbutrin, it's the happy, horny, skinny drug. OK. <laughs> That's not just irresponsible, that's copyright infringement. Because there is only one happy, horny, skinny drug, and that is crystal meth. That's a fact. So that, that's a fact right there. And, and for, for the increasing number of doctors who will refuse even to see drug reps, the companies have one other trick up their sleeve. Simply paying doctors to talk to other doctors about their products over dinner. And that sounds ridiculous but not as ridiculous as the special ego-boosting title they use. I essentially say to a doctor, hey, our company has identified you to be a thought leader. Would you like to be a thought leader for our company? Uh, the doctor would normally almost every time say yes. Yeah, of course they say yes. That's an appealing phrase. Doctors like to be called thought leaders the same way that Brendan Fraser likes being called two-time Academy Award winner Brendan Fraser. <laughs> it's, it's clearly not true, but it's got a lovely ring to it. And look how happy it makes him. Look at... Give the guy a gong. Look how happy he is. In fact, the problem is, for a position described as thought leader, not a lot of thought goes into the job. In many cases, the slides and the content and the script are actually prepared by the drug company. It's not always uh, clear to the audience that this is material that was really scripted completely by the drug company that was paying the doctor to give the talk. OK, so, so if you're a doctor just regurgitating a script, you're not really a thought leader so much as you are a thought-sayer. Abraham Lincoln was a thought leader. You're more like the animatronic Lincoln at Disneyland. <laughs> now, now... To be fair, again, GlaxoSmithKline will no longer pay for thought leaders, and the industry in general claims they're reforming. In fact, a spokeswoman for Pharma, the drug industry's trade group, has even bragged about the tough new restrictions they've put in place. In our pharma code, we say that pharmaceutical representatives could, can bring an occasional meal, um, a modest meal, turkey sandwiches, pizza, um, I don't want to just focus on turkey, maybe we could have ham sandwiches, uh, but modest meals, not steak in a restaurant. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Not in a restaurant, although we probably allow a steak at an Outback Steakhouse because, come on, that's not a great steak. That's basically a chunk of horse meat with grill marks drawn on it with a sharpie. So no, no one's getting ethically compromised by that. That's what we're saying. This voluntary pharma code is, I guess, a step in the right direction. So let's see how one of their members 
have been avoid abiding by it. The Justice Department filed a civil fraud lawsuit against the Swiss drug maker Novartis, accusing it of paying kickbacks and lavishly spending on doctors, including taking some out to Hooters in exchange for prescribing its drugs. Don't worry. Research has shown the best medical decisions are always made with an Aristona State College football game blasting in the background. <laughs> but at least Hooters qualifies as a modest meal. They allegedly also pay doctors to speak at places like L20 in Chicago, a restaurant whose Zagat review reads, and I quote, tabs may bring tears to your eyes, so many say it's for special occasions only, unless, of course, you go on someone else's <laughs> diet. I'm guessing at the end of the meal, the waiter came over and asked, separate checks, or is one person buying your influence? Just one, is it? <laughs> oh, that's very nice of him. There you go. And at least they were there for that one. The, the suit says many doctors took payments for speeches they never even gave, all of which Novartis has denied, saying that everything they did had a legitimate business purpose, and besides, speaker programmes like theirs are an accepted and customary practice in the industry, which is kind of the whole point. Even in its best form, hiring doctors as paid spokesmen seems like a conflict of interest, and multiple reports have found that many drugs' top prescribers are also often getting money from that drug's company, which is worrying, because we trust doctors. When you see Rihanna trying to get you to drink coconut water, <laughs> you know she's getting money to do that, and you take that into account. You think to yourself, no, I I'm glad you're getting paid, Riri, but, um... <laughs> I I'm actually not going to drink that, because you and I both know that coconut water tastes like cereal milk mixed with bull semen, so <laughs> we both know that, so I'm gonna take that into account when I make this decision for myself. I know this has all been disheartening, but luckily, there is actually some good news here. A new clause in the Affordable Care Act will, for the first time ever, allow average citizens to search a federal website to see all of the perks given to physicians by pharmaceutical companies. Now, I know what you're thinking. What, a federal website made up of a list of doctors? Hold on, let me command T up a new tab right now. <laughs> but, but look, this website is actually kind of fascinating. The first batch of numbers are now online, covering the last five months of 2013, and you can, and absolutely should, go online and look up your doctor at this address and see what you find. Maybe you'll find your doctor did a, a little research for a drug company, which is probably fine, or maybe, as ProPublica did, when they looked at pharma payments, you'll find a doctor who's earned more than a million dollars delivering promotional talks and consulting. Or maybe, like we did, you'll find a doctor who got food and beverages one day worth four cents. <laughs> I have to know what that meal was. <laughs> because the only way a four-cent meal makes sense is if that doctor is a mouse. That's the only way it makes sense. <laughs> Wipe the cheese it dust off your whiskers before you prescribe me anything. The point is, there is information on this database you should know. And this should really be just the beginning. If drug companies really want to regain our trust, Maybe they should let us know the effect that their money has on doctors in the only way they know how. Have you noticed anything strange about your doctor? Does he seem happier than usual these days? Is he quick to prescribe drugs you think you might not need? No, I, one more, actually. Does his waiting room frequently feature surprisingly attractive, not sick-looking people? Well, that may be because your doctor's been taking pharmaceutical money. Pharmaceutical money takes many forms, from free lunches to speaking fees. Here's how it works. Money combines with the cash receptors in your doctor's wallet to create fast-acting financial relief. So your doctor can rest easy and enjoy life. <laughs> Common side effects of doctors taking money may include chronic overprescription, unusually heavy cash flow, dependency on free samples, inflammation of confidence, affluenza, and an increased tendency to suggest off-label prescriptions, which in turn can cause heart attack, stroke, loss of feeling in arms and legs, seizures, blurred vision, grinding of the teeth, temporary deafness, total blindness, numbness, sudden bursts of rage, reduction of trust, angry erections lasting over 17 hours, and death. Ask your doctor today if he's taking pharmaceutical company money. Then ask your doctor what the money is for. 
ask your doctor if he's taken any money from the companies who make the drugs he just prescribed for you. Then ask yourself if you're satisfied with that answer. Pharmaceutical money. Ask your doctor if his taking it is right for you. I think that's incredibly hilarious, and I can't listen to that over and over again because there's so much truth there. If you get to see it, it's, well, I found it on YouTube. So uh, it's there. If you get to see it, show it to your doctor. I think you'll find it hilarious. I had experience with pharmaceutical reps myself, actually. One time when I was much younger, I don't know, 30 years ago, I ran into a bunch of girlfriends who were all exceptionally gorgeous. What were they? They were all pharmaceutical reps. Uh, I don't know what kind of perks they were giving out, but uh, they certainly were beautiful women. And there were men there, too. By the way, there were men. I, I didn't mention them, but there were men. I think that this HBO special is also interesting because it highlights what's going on uh, with the public awakening and the satanic agenda. If you notice, uh, HBO is, you know, it's owned and controlled by the cabal. There's only five or six companies that control everything that goes on TV and in the media. So this information isn't secret information. It didn't leak out. I remember I sent this to a friend yesterday, and he wrote back. He said, this guy's a lot of balls. And I wrote back, and I said, not really. He couldn't do anything unless it was sanctioned by the people that own and run HBO. And they're all in league with the pharmaceutical industry, and they're all in league with the medical community. So it's all one, one block what this is a prime example of, and you're going to see a lot more of it in the next year or so. This is what the Satanists call the externalization of the hierarchy. Now, what this means is that the control system that has been hidden behind the veil, the, the hidden hand that's been controlling who gets elected president, the hidden hand that's been controlling what conflicts um, in the Middle East happen. The hidden hand behind who becomes a, uh, a movie star and who doesn't wants to come out in the open because the types of control that they're, they want to institute now can't be done through puppets or proxies. They have to, it has to be done straight out. In other words, we're going to know exactly what's happening. So the idea the idea of this video is to make you laugh at the absurdity of this situation. And if you think about it, how absurd it is, how absurd it is that a doctor is bribed and paid to prescribe something that's not beneficial to the health of their patients, to their patients. And the more they prescribe that, the more money they make, the more perks they, they get. I don't know whether they get sexual favors from these pharmaceutical reps or not. I have no idea. But that certainly would be an incentive for, for a lot of them. So that's, that's happening. They admit it. This is what's happening. Let's laugh at it. Let's go on. What they want you to do as they externalize all of the t their type of control as they externalize the hierarchy. They want you to listen to it, laugh at it, and say, well, that's the way it is. There's not really much we can do about it. Yeah, that's the way it is. My God, you know, that's the way they are. And I just have to, I hope that my doctor is uh, a little bit more on my side. Well, they can't be. They're monitored by the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Everything that they prescribe, the pharmaceutical company that makes it knows that that doctor prescribed it. So they're, they're monitored. They can't not prescribe it. If I was telling, you know, in the last hour, I was a little bit um, irate about doctors prescribing things that weren't in the best interest of their patients. And uh, maybe they can't. 
maybe if you want to continue in that fat cat profession, uh, you have to play the game and play their game. And unless you're somebody with a lot of guts like Lynn Horowitz uh, and you stand up and make a stand up, there's a lot of doctors that do this. Listen, there's a lot of doctors in the United States. There are doctors with cancer cures that have stood up and uh, like, what's his name, Julius? Julius Simonetti. Simonetti. He cures cancer in, in, in Europe. He can't get a, of course, he can't get his license back. To, he used to be a cancer doctor. Can't get his license back because because he cures one of the biggest profit items on their menu. So there are a lot of people standing up, and there's a lot of really honorable doctors. There are a lot of doctors, actually, who, I wouldn't say it's the majority. I wouldn't say it's the majority by far. But there's a lot of people that went into that because they really wanted to help people, not because they wanted to please their parents or get a gorgeous wife because they make six figures plus. But that's called the externalization of the hierarchy. And we're going to see that happen with uh, probably vaccines. Actually, you have to be really uh, unaware of what's going on with vaccines to not see how blatantly obvious that is. It happens with the police state now. They don't mind pulling you over and drawing blood now in the United States. Every day there's new videos on YouTube of police beating the shit out of somebody or just killing them. Happens all the time. The fact that they're allowed to put those videos on is the externalization of the hierarchy. They want to show you what they're doing. Now, there's other videos. Like I remember a couple weeks ago, actually it's probably a couple months ago now, there was a video out called We Need to Talk About Sandy Hook. And it was about the Sandy Hook hoax. And it pulled apart details that made it impossible for that not to be a hoax. Well, the mainstream media, YouTube and everybody, any way to get that thing out was shut down, censored. They did not want you to know about that particular incident because they had more work to do, more things to pull out of that particular incident. They didn't want you to know about that yet. So that was under deep censorship. Something like this? No. We want you to know about it. We want you to laugh about it. Yeah, they're corrupt, but they're funny old corrupt guys. You know, that's how they're going to do it, and that's how they're going to pull it out. So if it comes out through the mainstream media, or what I'm going to call the mainstream alternative media, uh, you know that it's sponsored by them, and they want you to know about it. Speaking of that, you know, Mindy and I always complain about people who watch TV. Don't get your news from TV because, well, it's, first of all, it's a brainwashing tool. And second of all, the people that control the TV news are not on your side. They want you to behave and act and think in a certain way. And they know how to program you to do that. And they're really effective at it. So if you want to know what's going on, you have to, first of all, pick up your clicker, point it at your TV, and turn it off. I would suggest turning the TV to the wall if you have to have it in the room at all. But people have come to me and said, well, where would I get my news then? Well, it's, it's a dodgy. It's a dodgy item now. When you go out and you're looking for news on your own, it's really tough. And I would suggest that before you start doing that, uh, you read David Icke's book, The Perception Deception. Because you don't know who's kidding you or who's fooling you unless you know the totality of the, of the horrible fate that you're being led to by the cabal. You need to know about that because otherwise you're going to be pulled by this deceptive tactic or that deceptive tactic. You need to know the overall strategy. I have a book called Belief Magic that will give you some a lot of information about how they want they control your mind from the beginning. It's important that you know the overall plan. David Icke has other videos uh, that are available. Can you think of anything else that would give them the overall 
um, picture? I would probably recommend going onto David Icke's website and buying the um, pay-per-view version of his last 10-hour talk that he gave at Wembley because in those 10-hour talks, as you know, we went to one in New York several years ago, he takes the up-to-the-minute information that he's gathered over 25 years and he presents it to his audience over 10 hours. It's a long time, but he covers everything and it's really well done. So I might start there. Right. I was thinking you could go to Lynn Horowitz and you could learn a lot from that, but you need a top-down look at what's going on. And I trust David Icke uh, explicitly to do that. Here's yeah. another thing I might look into. There's two documents that pretty much tell everything about the overall plan. And you could either read the documents themselves or you could uh, read a book about the documents. For example, Rosa Corey's book, Behind the Green Mask, where she details the Agenda 21, the United Nations plan for the 21st century. And that document tells it all. I mean, it, it gives the whole plan and it puts into context and perspective why all these things are being perpetrated right. on the people. If you know their plan, then you can understand why they would do what they do. So that one, and then there's another document you can get off the internet called um, Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, or Quiet Weapons for Silent Wars. Right, if you go on the, uh, regarding Rose, the Rosa Cory book, that's well sourced and totally documented. There's no equivocation, I mean, that's, that's real fact, and she'll explain. The other one is, oh, the, uh, it's hard to source back it. Quiet Weapons for Silent Wars, or right. Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars. Yes, it's uh, atrocious, actually. To it's see, atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> to see, you know, the overall plan for humanity by the people who actually um, control everything until we stand up and stop going along with it. Right. Stop complying, and then we control everything. But we're not there yet. Not there yet. So I would suggest, David, like to try to get an overview. Um, his books are so well sourced. I mean, we have one sitting here that Mindy just read from. It looks like a, um, it's about a thousand pages. And the last, I don't know, 300 are probably his references. Everything he says in there is sourced and referenced. And, uh, no, how many? There's not that many pages of references, but he puts his references throughout the text. So oh, he does. He does, yeah. Okay, so so I would suggest starting with that, turn off the TV and read David Icke's book, or watch his ten-hour uh, Wimple Wim, Wembley presentation. Right, and here's what I would suggest for your TV: keep your TV, but disconnected from the source where all the information comes from and hook it up to your computer. That way you can watch YouTube documentaries, videos, exposés on your big television screen right. and sit back on your couch and enjoy some real information and stop being snowed under by what's being showed on your TV. All right, I'm gonna, let's go into some of the things that we watch. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that all these things are totally reliable on everything. But I'm, what I'm saying is this is where we would go, but of course we're informed because we know the overall, the overall structure of the deception. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you that there's enormous amounts of cabal energy going into the liberal media. Uh, for example, Salon.com gets massive amounts of money from George Soros. So does Pacifica Radio and all of those liberal sources. We've talked about this many times on this show, that the people that are attracted to liberal thoughts are the ones that are closest to being able to spring themselves and see the reality in terms of thinking on a higher level. Certainly there are people 
from all levels of consciousness maturity who are waking up. But I can see why the why the cabal would be dumping massive amounts of money into these these liberal media. So if you consider it a liberal a liberal outlet, I think I would stop going there. Um, and how would you check for that? Well, I would check for find out how they feel about the global warming hoax or the climate change hoax. Um, that is a major component of Agenda 21. Agenda can't Agenda 21 can't happen without that. So your all your liberal media are going to say that that's your most important uh, your most important problem. I mean, Chris Hedges, who is an incredibly intelligent guy, very insightful, he works for the liberal media. He's a liberal mouthpiece. So he'll tell you some really great information, but then end by saying, but the most important problem facing the world today is climate. I don't know what they, they call it. They, there's a new one that just came out, uh, amorphic, whatever. whatever. It's, it's new. They don't even call it climate change anymore. Uh, so that is one of their tactics to mislead people. They just use the same information but change the name of it so that they can garner new interest from people who figured out that that the last one they called it was a hoax. It's bullshit. Yeah. Once yeah. once they blow it apart, once they blow that name apart, they'll come back with a new name. They do it all the time. So I would look at that. Usually your liberal media is in favor of gun control, so you've got that component to look for. God, those combination. Uh, oh, also they're, they're really focused on diversity and this gender-neutral stuff and political correctness. I mean, they've got themselves all wound in feminism and all that stuff. Uh, so if the media that you're looking at seems to be caught up in that, I, I wouldn't trust them at all. Of course, you're going to get some good information, but they're going to try to spin it to give you the agenda. That's how they do it. They give you good information, but they put you down where they want to put you down on the agenda that's not in your interest. So, so watch out for that. There's massive amounts of money now, and they're creating new alternative medias. And these alternative media look like the normal media, look like the normal alternative media, but are really designed to mislead you. There's a lot of media out there going after them, uh, identifying them when they do that. So you have to stay on top of it. So so it's a dodgy game. You're, you're in a time on the earth where there's massive amounts of money, massive amounts of effort gone into deceiving you. So you have to put that same amount of effort into finding truth. And it's not something you can do um, in a half hour like you used to be able to wake up and read the newspaper and get a kind of an idea of what was going on. Actually, you didn't. Actually, they were as deceptive back then as they are now. But now there's a lot more slicked up um, media outlets and they launch these new alternative media outlets to try to to try to lead you astray. I, I would also look for money. How much money is flowing through this media outlet? If there's a lot of money flowing through the media outlet, I would I would cause it to be suspect. I might not throw it out, but I'd cause it to be suspect. Now let me. Let me talk about a few things, uh, a, few, a few ways that I get my news. When I get up in the morning, I check on uh, Prison Planet. That's Alex Jones's website. Now I know some of you people <laughs> who are really awake just fell off your chair, and I don't blame you. Uh, Alex Jones is, I, I consider him to be kind of a suspect choice for uh, keeping up to date on information. Uh, some people I've heard say that he works for M MI6. Uh, some people say he's directly related to the Jesuits. Uh, I have no proof of either of those things. I have no idea. Uh, I know that he has a tendency to 
give you the information and twist it to his agenda. He has a he has kind of a Christian um, liberal, but not that liberal agenda. Kind of a um, they call it a libertarian agenda. He's he's got candidates that he likes for political office, and I, I don't think he's just clear a clear and open source, but he is a good source for for information. Sometimes he creates the information. You also have to know with his channel or however you contact Alex that he is exceptionally good at. I can't say it's fear mongering. He actually uh, does a real good job at getting you excited and getting you tense and getting you um, off off of your even keel. I also find him suspect because he makes a lot of money, way too much money to... I, He's that innocent. There's nothing wrong with making money. I think there's something wrong with making more money than you need, but uh, he uh, he's a wealthy man and he poses as a counter to the mainstream. I don't think that somebody's going to be that successful unless they're kind of under the wing of, of somebody there. And, and I, You know, Alex is an incredibly talented guy. He's incredibly insightful. And uh, I don't want to discourage you I just, when you're just mucking around his site. A little bit careful. And he uses sigils now on his, on his video casts. Right. Which makes me suspect as well. Good. Let's get down to, through some other things. I then go to, um, I used to go to Drudge Report, but I can't go there anymore because it just upsets me too much that people would waste their time about uh, the inflation of, a, of an NFL football or what Kim Kardashian is wearing on the cover of a magazine or uh, American politics is so rigged. It's, it's so rigged that, you know, discussing whether Rand Paul is responding to Hillary Clinton, it's all bullshit. You have to know it's all bullshit. Um, and they'll, uh, Drudge does that. Now, I think he's, he's a wonderful person. He's doing a great thing. Um, but I, I can't use that source anymore. It just it gnaws at me. Then I go to David Icke's website. David Icke, um, a couple of months ago, he decided to keep his news headlines going. And he sources from all over the place. So go to David Icke's website, davidicke.com. And uh, that's another really good source. Uh, we also know that Max Egan's site has the same thing going on. He's got a, uh, if you scroll down to the bottom, he's got news items. And those news items, you see, if David or Max Egan vets them, you know that it's important for you to know. And uh, it, it has something to do with the overall agenda, one way or another. So you can go to those two on your way. Mm -hmm. Matt's, Max Egan's site is called thecrowhouse.com. Right. And they'll source to a lot of other websites, like Zen Gardner's website, uh, 21st Century Wire, Patrick Hennington's website. They, they, they'll source to a lot of things, and then, and when you... When you're, when you're sourced to those, there's no reason why you can't put them on your um, list of websites to go to frequently if you want to. I don't do it because I don't want to spend that much time going to the subsources. I have plenty more for you to do <laughs> before, before you go. I also go about twice a week to Red Ice Radio. This is Hendrik Palmgren's site. Now, this is an incredibly intelligent guy who, as far as I'm concerned, is working for the betterment. He's only into expanding mind. He's, he's kind of sidetracked lately on uh, the plight of wh white people in Europe. But you can find a lot of information on a lot of things. We just found out about 
Karlstrom, what was his first name? Eric Karlstrom, who knows a lot about 9-11 and a lot about the New Age religions, which is another thing that's going to be coming out as we externalize the hierarchy. All of these religions are going to be wanting to blend into one, and that's part of the thing. That's part of the externalization. And he turned me on to that. So I wouldn't, I'm a Red Ice member, and I wouldn't give that up for anything. Check it out. It's not expensive. And uh, the man is, he's the best interview I've ever heard. He's the best interviewer I've ever heard. What about you, man? I would agree. Right. I would agree. He asks very intelligent questions, and he has no ego in it, so he doesn't take away from the people that he's interviewing. He really gives them a good platform to cover the material that they want to cover. Also, there's another um, site called Slingshot Radio, but when I turn you on to Slingshot Radio, it just sources a bunch of other sites. Some of them I trust, some of them I don't trust. So don't use that as your as your basis for, for whether it's factual or not. Now, moving along quickly, I would make sure that on my YouTube channel, I had several, I would have these three heavyweight channels, and I would check them daily and put them on your favorites so that YouTube will load them in for you. They're new things every day. Luke Rutkowski's site called wearechange.org or wearechange.com. Org. Org. He's a fantastic reporter. He's, he's, um, he started off just gutsy interviews with high-level people. He's famous for his Kissinger interviews. And now he's becoming an analyst. He's trying to birth more journalists like him that aren't afraid to get down and do journalism. And he's becoming a commentator, too. And his comments are right on target. He's right in there, and he knows what he's talking about. Uh, moving along, you need to know about James Corbett. Uh, the Corbett Report. You need to you need to subscribe to his channel. Um, by the way, these two guys, if you can send them money, it's always really good. Luke's site, We Are Change, especially James Corbett. James Corbett is an independent guy in Japan, and he does in-depth analysis that we've used on making our videos. And I really depend on him for the uh, type of the type of left brain analysis that I can't do for myself, because he really knows how to vet sources. He really knows how to get in there, and I pretty much I, I disagree with him on things. I disagree with most of these people on things, but they're my sources for news. I and, just want to say real quick uh, that you know to to subscribe to these channels costs nothing. I mean, if you want to make donations to these people, that's fabulous because that helps them continue to their ongoing research. But you can go to any of these sites for free with no membership fee to get the information, especially from their their um, headlines, their news headlines, right. part of their sites. Oh, and most of them will have a, an email updates. So they're really easy to, to learn from. And then there's Dan Dix, Press for Truth. Uh, that's another one. He's uh, right in there with uh, James Corbett and Luke Rutkowski. I'm just coming upon his research now. He's new for me, um, but he's, he's advocated by Luke and James. Actually, they're doing Narcapulco in Mexico together. And try to train more journalists to Anarchapulco. do it. Anarchapulco. Anarchapulco. Thank you. You're welcome. Then there's my little private stock. This is my favorite source of news. Um, these guys are independent journalists uh, like you and I, and they work really hard to expose hoax and uncover truths. Uh, one of them is Jeff C. on Free Radio Revolution. Jeff C. on Free Radio Revolution. Now, he tells it like it is. So the language on his site might be a little spicy for some people. But I was raised in an environment where 
Um, you tell it like it is. And Jeff C. tells it like it is. And uh, his cohort in this uh, calls himself R RPR, Red Pill Revolution. Now, he's taken down that website. He's put up uh, the Truth Media Revolution, I believe. But if you go to Jeff C.'s Free Radio Revolution, you'll see that he links up and is associated with several other websites. And actually, these people did. I, I've been out of touch since I've been in the hospital. Group, um, what can you call panel discussions with one another. Here's what they do. They'll analyze a news story and uncover a hoax. And... Uh, They'll talk about it between several of these journalists. I consider them journalists of a much higher quality than anything you'll see on CNN or Fox News. These guys are true journalisms, journalists, and they have, they have a lot of guts. And they're not all guys. There are women involved with this group, too. Um, they were the ones, I don't know whether you, about a month ago or at the turn of the year, we were talking about their hoaxopedia and uh, exposing who won the best crisis actor hoax and who was, you know, what was the best hoax of the last year. And they've made it into a real, a real fun thing to watch. But they've also made fun of the cabal. And the one thing that the cabal hates, hates, hates more than anything else is to be made fun of. Uh, so they're really after these guys. They shut down their websites all the time. Uh, they pursue them all the time, but they just keep coming out with more and more truth. Now, what's interesting about them right now is they're, they're, the bunch of them have been analyzed the, the, the crash of this Asian airliner. And when it first came out, they were calling it a hoax, except I don't think Jeff C. was. I think Jeff C. was holding back. Now, they're getting new information, better footage, and they're saying, no, it's not a hoax. That we were wrong before. Some of them are. Some of them aren't. We were wrong before. And if you look at this and look at this, this couldn't possibly be staged. You don't know how wonderful that sounds to me. When someone's awakening... You're going to be wrong. You're going to be wrong part of the time because you're going into the fringe. You're looking into things that other people don't know about. The awakening is about being wrong. And when you find journalists that admit that they were wrong or try to call someone else on being wrong, it's, 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 it makes me happy. I just smile all over when that happens. Also, Jeff C. is a real shill detector and troll detector. He knows who's in there working for who and, and uh, what they're trying to do. So if you, if you get into free revolution radio, Jeff C. stuff, you'll realize that he really calls them out on no uncertain terms. Um, if RPR comes back on, his language is a little bit better. He's a highly intelligent guy. Both of these guys are. Highly intelligent and insightful. Plus, the, the other journalists that they work with are also. And when they have a conference call, try to hear it because you'll learn so much about what's going on in your world. Now, I want to mention before we go, I think we're close to the end here. Mm -hmm. We've got about seven minutes left. Okay. I, I also want to mention some places where we get news, but it's also news and commentary. And these are websites that I belong to that... I would suggest try them out. If you don't like them, unsubscribe. <laughs> A guy I've been enjoying lately is K.J. Osborne. K.J. Osborne from the scariest movie ever. Just hearing his voice makes me relaxed and happy. He sees stuff that's there. He's very insightful. He's, uh, he's an amazing guy. I've been trying to get in touch with him, and I can't. Uh, maybe you'll hear this and, and get in touch with me. K.J. Osborne, the scariest movie ever. Uh, another website is called The Black Child. He's got some... He, 
he doesn't do commentary. He puts together various pieces of of a video that tell a story in itself. Sometimes it's a little arcane and you don't get it. Other times you think, oh my God, I was watching that and I didn't see it. It's amazing. Uh, the one that we really loved, although he doesn't make many videos, is called Barely Human 11. And this guy does things on synchronicity. He's able to see synchronicity and things happen in the past so that he'll take something like the Kennedy assassination and see how it was referred to and used in something like Back to the Future or predictive programming involved in Back to the Future. Mm. Oh yeah, we always enjoy when they analyze <coughs> different Hollywood films and show us the symbolism and the predictive programming because it's it's a lot more fun to actually watch these things when you can see what they're trying to do through the media. Now, one thing you mentioned, these were websites, but aren't these YouTube they're channels? They're YouTube channels, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. These are YouTube channels, so all you have to do is get into YouTube and then type in these names and find their channel. Right, and they'll keep you up to date. And if you subscribe, then you can see their latest thing quite easily because it comes onto your page when you right. sign into YouTube. But things like K.J. Osborne, uh, the scariest mover ever, I just go back and make, do one a night before you go into doing something else in the evening just to bring you You'll be totally entertained. The man is uh, very talented. Also, I can't stop without mentioning Alfred Lambermont Weber. Mm -hmm. Alfred Lambermont Weber, both French spelling for Lambermont and Weber. And... Uh, He's got a great uh, channel. Now, Alfred um, is really fringy. He interviews the most fascinating guests, and they will fall into the realm of things that are hard for you to believe if you're new to this. Right. But we always find most of them quite fascinating. But although not always credible. Not always. And not everything they say is always credible, but he's certainly... Uh, or something to have in your channel subscriptions. Can you think of any other? I'm thinking that I've really enjoyed the work that Mark Passio is doing lately. Oh, yeah. He's really uncovering um, amazing uh, insights into Satanism, Satanism, basically. And what is his website? Oh, whatonearthishappening.com is his website. And I'm not real familiar with it, but whenever I hear him give a presentation, I'm always very impressed with him. Yeah, he's really clear thinking. He's He does excellent work on debugging the New Age topics. And here's another one. Lately we watched an interview with Neil Sanders and his website, which I haven't yet checked out myself, but I always enjoy listening to him talk, is neilsandersmindcontrol.com. Yeah, Neil Sanders is really up to date on on, on the mind control topic and how it plays out in your everyday life. Right. In fact, he covers some of the material you covered in your book, Belief Magic. I haven't read the book, but I think I'm going to look for it. Your thoughts are not your own. And this is pretty much the area that you covered in Belief Magic. Right. With Neil, he has a little bit of a, I don't know, I guess it's a Scottish accent, and he talks quickly. So you have to pick up your feet and just go with him. <laughs> Maybe you have to listen to the interview twice, but he's uh, fantastic. And then, of course, we like Thomas Sheridan. Oh, yes, very at much. At thomassheridanarts.com. He's a great, you're not going to get news from him, but you'll get analysis from him that's unparalleled. Um, so that's all I can think of. If you, um, We're pretty much out of time, so that's good timing. Is there anything else you want to add? No, that's it, Mindy. All right. Thank you well, for listening. Thanks for tuning thank in. Thank you for tuning in to the World Beyond Belief. We're so pleased that you're coming along with us for this ride into insanity. God knows. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll be back again next week. And uh, look for us on YouTube, too. We, um, in addition to the World Beyond Belief, we have a blog. It's called Pinecone Utopia. Dot .yolasite.com 
and we have a, a YouTube channel, Pinecone Utopia. Oh, subscribe to that. YouTube. So if you subscribe, you can get all of our latest videos because we we make videos uh, well, monthly, one or two. Bi what was the new month? one? The new one is called the Control Matrix. Oh gosh, we changed the title. We changed the, the title because it used to be Swan Song for the Control Matrix. But nobody clicks. No one wants to know about song swans. So we, it, it's something it like. Picks, oh dear. We'll get back to you on this one. <laughs> we'll go to our channel. It'll be the last be the one last that we one, uploaded, yeah. and you can see it. It's a beautiful film. So please check that out as well. And stay well. Be happy. Stay safe. And uh, we'll bye catch bye. you next week.